Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, MIT IoT seminar series. Um, today, I'm very excited that we have Professor uh, Kevin Fu from the University of Michigan, um, who will be telling us about his work on the physics of embedded security. Um, Professor Fu has done enormously exciting work and often surprising and many times scary uh, at, uh, when it comes to security and what it means to think about security in the physical world. Um, he has won uh, amazing honors and awards, including being named the world's top innovator by Technology Review, um, Sloan Research Fellowship, um, I, an IEEE Fellow. Uh, he's received the Fed 100 Award, uh, the Security and Privacy Test of Time Award, really so many awards that I would not um, have enough time to, to list all of them. Otherwise, we will spend this entire a seminar just listing them. He got his undergraduate, master's, and PhD uh, degrees from MIT. Uh, and he's gone on since to do amazing work, truly inspiring um, and uh, transformational. Um, some of you might have seen his work in the news, whether it's in New York Times or on CNN, where uh, they talk about the implications of his work on society. Um, I remember some of one of the earliest projects that I was familiar with was when he showed that you could um, the, the the problems with security with medical implants uh, and how pacemakers can be hacked, but also how you can secure them moving forward. But he's also gone ahead and repeatedly shown these from how you can fake accelerometer data on your Fitbit if you want to uh, beat your friends to um, to some of the interesting and, ch and challenging aspects of uh, smart, uh, smart devices. And today I'm very excited. I, one thing that I know that is that you're in for a treat. Uh, I've seen uh, multiple of his talks and every time it's, um, they're surprising and they're, and they're exciting and also um, intellectually stimulating. Uh, so without further ado, Kevin, um, the floor is yours. All right, uh, thanks Fidel. Uh, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'll start the slides in a moment. Um, also, just you know, it's uh, I you know I learned so much. Uh, so I see Ron's on the line. So I, I did my PhD with uh, Ron's and Franz uh, way back when, and so uh, you know you learn from the best. But actually, I've got my class picture right up here from uh, 1990. I don't know four or something. But uh, let's let's get started. Um, let me share my screen in a secure manner. All uh, right. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. All right, um, so let's just get started. Uh, we have a lot to cover and we'll see how much uh, I can get through today. Um, to set the stage, I'm going to try to cover in 45 minutes a lot about um, some interesting uh, side channels and computer systems. Side channels have become quite popular in the last few years after some fairly high profile research. Uh, more in the digital domain, but exploiting interesting uh, timing side channels, power side channels, uh, but also exploiting timing uh, and power to cause uh, injection of interesting problems, flipping bits in computer machines. And this is my only crypto slide I'm going to show today, but I have to say a lot of this was inspired by a really cool paper in 1997, where simply uh, flipping a single bit in a register uh, and then using GCD uh, could allow someone to extract their private key material uh, from a smart card that was doing Chinese remainder theorem in, um, in a not so secure manner. Um, but today we're going to talk about a non cryptographic problem uh, of what I like to call sort of analog side channels. Um, we're going to look at the problem of how do you not protect confidentiality of information, but how do you protect the integrity of information when all sorts of physics can come into play and start to change computational abstractions. So we're surrounded by sensors all over the place. Uh, I think I don't need to dwell too long on this. Medical devices, autonomous vehicles. Um, you can see an article I wrote in CACM a couple of years ago on this subject. Um, but to get things started, I want to talk about accidents before we get into the world of threat models and computer security. Um, so here's a quick video from the New York Times. A gentleman, um, whenever his cell phone would ring, I'll just play it. Whenever his cell phone rings, his broiler spontaneously ignites. Mm -hmm. 
All right, and that was not Borat. Um, but what was going on here is nobody really knows. But what I suspect is the cell phone was probably emitting radio waves at the resonant frequency, probably of a length of wire between the buttons and the microcontroller that is um, causing these kinetic changes, such as starting an, um, an ignition system. And so those kinds of things I've seen in the news over the years, and it got me really excited about, well, why do we trust what sensors are telling us in the first place? It's just coming from a wire. And we put them in all sorts of interesting things from the benign Fitbits, the tra uh, uh, airbag control, uh, even CubeSats today are replacing reaction wheels uh, with interesting um, uh, uh, solid state uh, MEMS uh, inertial sensors in order to um, uh, keep things uh, uh, in space at uh, an appropriate place. So to me, uh, the digital abstraction is often treated like a magic force field. We teach it an introduction to programming, um, uh, but it's not a magic force field because everything from vibration to light can actually cause sensors to produce incorrect outputs. And then it's sort of like the, the early days of the web where we have uh, uh, unvalidated user input just being given to some computer programs. Of course, the computer is gonna make some poor decisions when we allow this um, uh, malicious input. So, whoops, where are we? So uh, let me just give you one simple example. Uh, and this is some work uh, by Sarah Rampazzi who works in my lab and is just about to start a, a faculty position in Florida. Uh, but a thermocouple uh, its job uh, in combination with software is basically to display temperature. But what's really going on is it's interpolating what it thinks is the temperature of the room from a voltage potential across two different metals. Um, and so if you just happen to put an antenna nearby, you can actually cause the software to display values like here you can see uh, uh, negative 1,847 degrees Fahrenheit uh, on my thermocouple, a commercial thermocouple of all things. Um, and of course, if you taken any you know, high school physics, you'll know um, that's absolutely impossible. In fact, that's below absolute zero uh, at negative 770 Kelvin. Um, but whoever wrote this software apparently was fine displaying this ludicrously low value, all because the radio interference was causing uh, incorrect uh, uh, voltages uh, on this line. Um, and that was some work published at ACM CCS uh, just before the pandemic. Um, why do we need to care about this? Well, it turns out cryogenic chambers use thermocouples in order to cycle coolant. Where do we care about that? Well, if you want to ship a vaccine at negative eight, uh, 80 centigrade, you're going to have thermocouples. Um, if you are going to protect embryos, you're going to have thermocouples. Um, so these are fairly commonplace enough that we do depend on them. So we want to make sure we can have trust uh, in our devices um, are using sensors correctly. Um, I'm going to go through um, a couple older examples just to set the stage um, to sort of level set sensors here. I'm going to first move into a little bit of RF uh, from one of my former postdocs, uh, Dennis Foucoun. Um, and again, I'll try to go quickly since some of you may have seen this before. Um, but we were looking at why does a pacemaker believe its sensors of the cardiac tissue? Um, so we started looking at microphones and we noticed, well, you know, most microphones, um, uh, have a length of wire between whatever's transducing the, the sound pressure waves into electrical signals, and then it goes through an amplifier and all sorts of other uh, circuitry. Well, if you know the length of wire between the mic and the amp, you can find its resonant frequency and you can deliver RF uh, that has really high Q, uh, and you might be able to inject false sounds, fake sounds that are really radio, uh, into the system. Um, and indeed you can. Uh, because if you take, uh, I'm not sure what MIT calls it anymore, but it used to be called 002 when I was there. Um, but uh, you can make really simple uh, 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 low pass filters that'll get rid of high frequency noise. Um, but if the malicious signal is coming in in the baseband where you're expecting to see uh, frequencies, it's much harder to do at the analog level and suddenly you need to have your software get involved. Um, so to test this um, sort of like, hmm, I wonder if this uh, could be a real problem. Uh, we uh, took a software uh, programmable radio uh, and we have a, a small webcam where we took away the plastic housing um, and about a meter away we delivered RF uh, and we hooked up a little Mac uh, to record what it heard in the room and this is what was heard. All right, it's Pi o'clock, so we get a Weezer song. Um, 
what was going on here is that the microphone has, again, a piece of wire. Uh, we knew its length and we could measure its resonant frequency. And so we delivered AM modulated uh, radio that happened to modulate um, a Weezer song onto it. Um, interesting side note, if you have a really crappy um, uh, smartphone, it turns out if you want to play like classical music playing in an airport to a friend and hold it up, it's actually better quality if you just use uh, electric electromagnetic interference because it cuts through sort of the poor frequency uh, uh, response of, of really crappy microphones. But um, suffice to say, um, radio waves can uh, trick microphones into hearing phantom sounds. Why does this work? Um, this is an entire lecture onto its own, uh, but it basically has to do with nonlinearity and signals being copied. Um, but we basically turned the microphone into an unintentional radio demodulator. It was never designed to be, but because of some interesting choices in the circuitry, it behaves as one. Why does this matter in practice? Well, we put sensors in kinetic systems. And so a pacemaker, for instance, listens to the heart. And if it senses that there's no heartbeat, it will send a small shock to induce an artificial uh, uh, pacing signal, uh, uh, pacing of the heart. Most of the heart cardiac uh, signals are in about the 10 to 100 hertz range, so fairly low frequency, uh, kind of hard to get RF into that range, um, but uh, uh, there are ways to get it in. Um, so here we did a little setup where we've got um, a pacemaker inside a little saline solution and we're using just some leftover magnet wire uh, and we're um, sending in radio waves and then trying to see what does the pacemaker perceive the world to be like? Does it believe there's a heart beating or not? Um, cutting to the chase, uh, here we have a screenshot of what the physicians see in the electrophysiology laboratory when they have a patient. Um, we sent out a pulse sinusoid, so every one second to approximate 60 beats per minute, we just sent out the sine wave, um, duty cycling it, and lo and behold, um, the pacemaker missensed this. It noticed uh, uh, the signal onset. You'll see three ventricular sense uh, purple VS symbols going on on the bottom left. Um, that means the pacemaker said, oh, uh, this patient is beating their heart naturally. I'm going to go into power save mode and just stop the pacing shocks. Um, and when we turn off the interference, the pacing resumes. Uh, if this were a real patient, uh, their blood pressure would drop to zero and they would quickly fall unconscious. Uh, we couldn't find any volunteers, so we just used uh, this discarded pacemaker. Um, so that's the bad news. Um, the good news is I personally think this would be really uh, hard to do in practice uh, because the body just naturally absorbs RF at these frequencies. So we found that with reasonable power levels, it was very difficult to achieve more than five centimeters away from the patient. So if you're that close, there, there are bigger problems uh, at stake. Uh, but a body-worn device like an insulin pump, we have not tested and uh, there you don't have the saline solution of the human body absorbing the RF, so you may have some greater issues. So that was RF, and that was years ago, and we thought it was a one-off, really. Um, but then we started to see similar problems in other sensor systems. So in particular, uh, in some research we published at IEEE Euro Security and Privacy uh, called Walnut, um, we were able to use not radio, but we were able to use sound waves uh, to uh, inject, for instance, false steps into Fitbits. And then I'll show you a little bit more about what we could do. Um, this work was done by, uh, uh, led by uh, my, my uh, former student, Tim Triple. Uh, here's a little video where we have a Fitbit inside this acoustic chamber. We're sending in a, oops, you can't see it, 11 kilohertz signal. And the step count goes up, 82, 83, 84, 85, when we're playing sound waves near the Fitbit. Um, and this is because inside there's an accelerometer and the accelerometer is supposed to sense accel acceleration, but is actually sensing a proxy for acceleration. And there's a semantic gap between actual acceleration uh, and what it's sensing. And so it's missensing some of our vibrations uh, as if the Fitbit uh, had been accelerating, um, leading to these false steps, which would make a great ringtone, by the way. Um, let me show you a little video of how, how this works. Um, you can find this up on YouTube. Um, just, I would recommend don't play this YouTube video on certain Samsung uh, smartphones because it will uh, infect your sensors on the circuit board. Um, so we, we sort of teasingly call it a musical virus, but it's, it's not permanent. Um, we're going to play a music video and it's going to emit sound waves that mechanically couple from the speaker, speaker phone on the phone over the circuit board 
to the accelerometer soldered to that same circuit board. And then on the Mac, we're plotting the output of that 3D accelerometer. And you see one of the axes uh, reacting to the sound. You can see it's spelling out the word walnut um, because in 002, I always wanted my oscilloscope to speak words to me and I've achieved that goal here. Um, uh, and you can also lace it into other uh, music and sound waves. And as long as the other sound is in other frequency space, it really doesn't affect uh, the quality of the, the uh, fake um, injection. Um, so why is this possible? It's sort of similar to what we did with the RF. Um, there are resonant frequencies inside semiconductors, in particular with MEMS devices, which, by the way, are very popular in smartphones for their accelerometers and gyroscopes, as well as uh, uh, MEMS clocks uh, replacing the classic uh, quartz clocks in um, many computer systems. They resonate, and you can use sound waves to fool some of the cantilevers into um, having um, not just wrong information, but deliberately bad information. Um, I'm not going to have time to drill too deep in, into the uh, details here, but suffice to say, we tested a bunch of accelerometers. Um, they have some very interesting resonant frequencies. Um, by sweeping all the sound waves, which annoyed all the neighbors near my laboratory, um, you can figure out what sound waves elicit the greatest response. Um, and you can build from the, uh, from the um, resonant frequency, you can start to develop a couple different ways to control the output of the accelerometer. And um, it basically boils down to two different kinds of common problems in accelerometers manufactured today. Um, and by the way, I have to say the manufacturers were amazing in this space. Um, pretty much every manufacturer was affected. Um, but there's uh, sort of a five stage chain that's very common uh, for any kind of sensor. Uh, it has a sensing mass, basically something that moves around like a little cantilever. Uh, that turns um, a capacitance into a voltage through measurement. But these are really tiny signals, and so there's a built-in amplifier. The amplifier goes through a low-pass filter to get rid of unwanted signals, and then it goes through an analog digital converter before the computer gets it over a wire, and then the software makes all the decisions like where to drive the car, how to change the satellite's inclination. A lot of things can go wrong in this process. In particular, in the second case, the low-pass filter uh, might be kind of crappy and overly permissive and let through a lot of the high-frequency signals. Um, it turns out you can synthesize uh, a way to control the output uh, of the accelerometer when you know uh, not just the resonant frequency, um, uh, but you can um, use those fluctuating uh, measurements. A second problem with some of the accelerometers is sort of a crappy amplifier. Um, it does uh, asymmetric clipping, basically chopping off the top or the bottom uh, of the waves. And that leads to, in combination with a low-pass filter, the low-pass filter gets rid of all the high frequencies. And what does it leave behind? Basically, a DC offset. Uh, and so there, you can control and set out a constant incorrect output uh, from the accelerometer. Um, and so the, those are the two building blocks. Um, it took the students quite a bit of work to come to these conclusions. Um, but uh, it boils down to these two um, sort of subtle flaws uh, in the design uh, of these devices. Um, so if you want to, for instance, display the word walnut, by the way, we use the word walnut because I asked the students to choose letters that were um, functions rather than relations and capital walnut happens to be a, a function for the most part. Um, uh, you just uh, do straight up AM modulation. Uh, and so you throw it over the, the resonant frequency as a carrier and um, the, uh, the, the MEMS accelerometer uh, just happily uh, demodulates it. Now, there are some interesting solutions to this that, you know, normally when a, a report comes out with a security problem, the US CERT says something like, apply this software patch. Um, what happened in this case was the manufacturers said, drill your holes differently in your circuit boards. So analog devices uh, um, uh, had a very interesting response. And I, I know they work very closely with CSAIL. Um, but in the old, uh, sort of in the status quo, um, these circuit boards are basically timpani drums. Um, and they will go up and down um, from the sound pressure waves hitting it. And so one way to reduce, but not eliminate the problem, is to put the mount points very, very close to the emitters or to the sensors. Um, and that 
causes it to become much more rigid and it throws a lot of the resonant frequencies closer to the ultrasonic range, which is harder, not impossible, but harder for an adversary uh, to have any appreciable effect. Um, they also recommended trenching where you actually cut the circuit board into pieces to separate your emitters from your receivers. So um, separate this loudspeaker uh, from your accelerometer. Um, so you have less mechanical coupling. And, and I thought that was very clever um, and a, a non-cryptographic way to reduce the problem. Also, it's one of the few times you see uh, trigonometry uh, inside a CERT report, but uh, there you go. Um, so that was sound waves um, and sensors. I want to talk a little bit about um, the property of availability rather than the property of integrity. Uh, and this is some work primarily read, uh, led by my um, PhD student, Connor Bolden, uh, published in Oakland uh, a couple years ago. Um, and um, he discovered how to use sound waves to stop hard drives from functioning. Um, although this was actually discovered more than 10 years ago um, by an engineer uh, who was in his data center and for, uh, for just for fun, apparently, he liked to yell at his hard drives. Uh, and every time he would yell at his stack of hard drives, the IO throughput would drop precipitously. You think, oh, operating system pathology? No, um, some interesting physics is going on. Um, they uh, uh, didn't really explain what was going on, so we drilled down a little bit deeper. Um, it turns out um, that modern hard drives uh, have quite a bit of uh, compensating circuitry and hardware for vibrations and drop detection. Um, but at the same time, a lot of computers and data centers uh, have speaker systems placed near these hard drives. Um, and so the threat model is an adversary who can deliver software to a laptop computer containing a hard drive or a data center and then have it play in the built-in mechanically coupled speaker or near a speaker that's placed um, uh, uh, nearby. So what's going on here? Um, we ran some physics simulations to understand what happens to a hard drive when you throw in um, all sorts of pathological sound waves um, uh, so, um, you know, you, uh, you used to learn this uh, in 6033. Uh, uh, I don't know if they teach this anymore, but, but uh, 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 inside the hard drive, when you throw sound waves at it, the, the disks are actually flexing. Um, and here you can see the red peaking up quite a bit at uh, five kilohertz, and that's about 500 nanometers of displacement. Um, for context, the algorithms and hardware inside most hard drives are really good at sort of single digit error correction for displacement. So we're a couple order of magnitudes outside of normal. Um, this happens all the time. You're on an airplane, you've got noise hitting your disc, but it's usually not constant. And so we're gonna deliver deliberately uh, malicious sound waves constantly until we overflow some of the built-in buffers of the hard drive uh, uh, firmware and hardware. Um, so just like with the accelerometers, we swept the whole thing with acoustics, uh, annoying a lot of the nearby laboratories with the humming. Um, and in this particular case, it turns out that around 18,000 uh, uh, or 18 kilohertz was uh, a frequency where we needed the minimum amount of amplitude to have any appreciable effect on a hard drive uh, writing ability. At this point, the hard drive is unable to write because the head uh, is moving ever so slightly from the disk such that it's not able to get uh, a durable write. Um, the hard drive will try to mask this error by buffering it in some solid state memory, but there's uh, an undisclosed uh, size for that buffer. And when it overflows, it simply drops the packets on the floor with no error messages to the operating system. And if you look at the Unix write system call man page, it actually has undefined behavior uh, under these conditions. And so most of the operating systems, Linux, Windows, will simply reboot uh, when we send these sound waves, uh, either through a nearby speaker or even just playing a sound wave over a website that somebody visits, visits when they're playing some JavaScript. Um, there's a second way that these hard drives uh, are influenced by sound, and that is most of them have shock sensors for drop detection. Uh, these have ultrasonic uh, resonant frequencies. So here, if you send out a little ultrasonic tone, uh, it's basically a binary switch and it parks the head uh, pretty much immediately. And so you can disable a hard drive that way. Um, where it gets a little more interesting is application. So one of my undergraduate researchers, uh, uh, Barbara here, is about to play a very annoying sound. At about 13 seconds, you're going to see her phone simply stop recording. And that's because we have a TV, or excuse me, we have a surveillance hard drive system. And the hard drive is hearing sound at this point um, and it buffers it. But as soon as the buffer fills up, it simply drops all the video on the floor and you lose about a minute of the video. 
Uh, we want to try this in a casino, but we don't want to get arrested. Um, but you can, uh, long story short, uh, it is stopping systems from having these durable writes. Uh, once the sound stops, whatever's in the buffer is then written out to the durable hard drive. There are also some weird pathologies that come up here. For instance, we had a, uh, a two gigabyte hard drive where after we played our sound waves near it, suddenly we had the best compression system in the world where the hard drive thought it was a two thousand petabyte hard drive. Uh, not quite sure how that happened, but we did see evidence of physical scratching on the disc uh, from time to time um, with a post-mortem uh, autopsy. Um, and again, it tends to sort of just uh, crash operating systems because it's tickling the undefined behavior of the right system call. Um, there are some ways to fix this. Um, so built into most hard drives are feedback control systems that try to stabilize the head against uh, uh, these kinds of vibrations, it's just not effective against a very persistent malicious uh, vibration. And so we created a second uh, attenuation controller and it's going to electrify the um, voice coil that's preemptively putting force on that head um, to compensate for the expected sound wave about to come. Because the adversary is periodic and it's a sine wave, we're able to do this. Uh, and it's kind of like aliasing or anti-aliasing. Uh, uh, to eliminate the adversary's uh, control. So um, we did some simulations on this. Uh, here, the blue line indicates how far off the center of the track the head is, uh, sometimes well uh, over um, uh, 50 nanometers. Um, but once we get our um, algorithms running, it actually stays within the error bounds for both reading and writing. Um, however, um, I don't know how well this would work in the long run. It's sort of like driving with two feet on the brake and the accelerometer at the same time. Um, it's probably being a little bit rough uh, on that electromagnet, but, uh, but it does allow the hard drive to read and write despite uh, adversarial sounds. Um, along the way, uh, one of my students discovered that not only could you do this, but you could actually turn a hard drive into a, a microphone. Um, and this is because built into most modern hard drives is something called a position error signal. It tells you with nanometer granularity how far off you are from the center of the track such that the firmware can compensate and then put an opposing electromagnetic force on it. This is exposed to the software stack in the hard drive firmware. And so a hard drive firmware virus coming from the operating system could, uh, in theory, turn these into microphones. Um, so we took uh, one of these hard drives and um, actually recorded a talk on it. Uh, let me see if I've got that here. Let me try to swap my screen, I'm going to change my sharing to, all right, right here. And let's see if this plays. I'll play a little video. Hopefully you can hear it. So um, I think we may have, uh, you know, you eat your own dog food, but there we were listening to our own dog food. Uh, let me go back to uh, the presentation. Um, so there, I just think there's a lot, there's a lot more unanswered questions in this space, in my personal opinion, than answered ones, uh, because it gets into sort of basic physics along with computer security. Um, and on that note, one of the more recent results we have uh, uh, was called uh, Light Commands. It was just presented at USENIC Security uh, just a couple months ago. Um, my, uh, one of my students, uh, Ben Sear, was involved. He's a PhD candidate, as well as Sarah Rampazzi. Um, she's about to start a job as a faculty member in Florida. Uh, and this was joint work with uh, faculty members at, uh, uh, excuse me, Daniel Genkin, a professor at Michigan, uh, as well as um, uh, Professor uh, Takashi Shugawara from Japan. Um, who originally introduced me to some of these ideas of using lasers to excite just things in general. Um, here's actually, you can see the photograph 
uh, uh, and this is not a doctored photograph, there's no um, enhancement going on. There's a laser that we put up in our bell tower and we're shooting at a Google Home uh, to control the voice control assistant. Um, I have a short video that I'm gonna show. I'm gonna skip the instructional one. It's a little bit, I think, too long. Uh, there's a fun cartoon one you can find at lightcommands.com. Uh, but let me skip forward to the one where we're shooting a laser from uh, the bell tower. All right, so we'll play this little video. Uh, it's pretty quick, um, but what you're going to see is a laser beam where its intensity is modulated, again, uh, just using AM modulation, and it's hitting the membrane of a microphone, a MEMS microphone. And because it's causing slight vibrations, which we've confirmed using a homemade uh, uh, laser interferometer that we built in lab, it's causing very, very slight um, uh, vibrations on the membrane of the microphone, which because of the built-in amplifier then turns it into what it perceives as audio and we can deliver speech to the system. Right. Um, so fun with physics. Um, I've actually um, helped to demonstrate that in elementary school uh, uh, museums now where the museum instructor will use vacuum chambers to teach the kids about just some basics of electronics. So it's a really fun experiment you can even do uh, with kids. Um, but I think um, we're, we're uh, looks like we've got maybe 10 minutes or so. Um, but I think um, uh, the take home message here is that, you know, it's not that we should run for the hills and give up on all these sensors. We'd be giving up on so many interesting applications. If you depend on sensors, you trust but verify them. And the problem is today the architectures are not really designed to be verifiable. Um, and so there are three things that I really believe needs to be done in order to push the field forward. Um, first of all, from sort of an educational standpoint, uh, in computer security, computer science, and electrical engineering, as well as um, some of the uh, sister disciplines of material science and mechanical engineering, we really need to demystify the analog uh, sensor attack surface. I think a lot of computer science over the last 20 years has been about covering up layers and layers of abstraction so we can create really interesting sort of cloud scale programs. But in the process, we've kind of created the computer science equivalent to the subprime mortgage where we don't really know why it works anymore. And that's because it doesn't. Um, and so we need to be able to test security to failure rather than testing to, uh, I don't know. Um, and we can unwrap these abstractions. There's a lot of fun uh, laboratory experiments, at least I give my uh, undergrads and graduate students so they can sort of understand the limits of these abstractions they're depending on. Uh, it's, it's sort of similar to the hardware equivalent of input validation on web, uh, 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 web CGI scripts of the 1990s. Um, but it's important for them to understand um, the, the analog equivalent to the buffer overflow. Um, the second is moving from this sort of rainbow world of ad hoc security. Hey, I just bought this and threw it at the wall and try to push it a little bit more toward measurable science. Um, part of this, uh, I think, is, uh, can resonate mostly with uh, the industry. In particular, I think we can uh, de-risk a lot of this intentional interference with more deliberate hardware specification and design. Um, so some manufacturers in response to this work have started publishing the resonant frequencies of their sensors. And that way their customers who then integrated in everything from satellites to automobiles can take uh, secondary measures or uh, introduce other compensating controls uh, such as um, noise dampening materials to keep those unwanted resonant frequencies out. Um, they can also at the software stack start to look for some of these unwanted resonant frequencies and instead of having this sort of naive childlike perception of sensors either being completely secure or completely insecure, they have this more ephemeral notion of, well, sensors can be fooled from time to time. And so if we can just check uh, to see and verify if they've been hit at any certain resonant frequency, we might temporarily not trust that sensor if we notice unusual um, uh, divergence from normal. 
And on that note, I think this is where changing the way we manufacture uh, sensors at the semiconductor level can be helpful. Rethinking the integrating circuits and the hardware software application uh, programming interfaces. The biggest thing that's missing right now is the ability for the software to ask the hardware, why should I trust the sensor output? The software is left to its own devices. It may be able to vote between three different sensors, but the sensor doesn't give metadata uh, or expose any kind of hints of the trustworthiness. And so I really believe hardware could do a much better job. I mean, simply a one bit output saying, have I been hit at my published resident frequency lately, would be a huge help for the software to then say, hey, you know what, we're not going to trust that sensor, or we're going to fall back on sort of a basal drip version of what we might be doing, um, sort of doing dead reckoning. Um, but we need a way for the software to make better decisions. All these security problems are classic emergent properties at the system level. Hardware is highly unlikely to be able to solve it completely, so it needs to give information to the software stack. That's not happening yet today. So it's going to probably take a few decades to fix that. Um, so what are these analog cybersecurity risks anyway? Um, computers have been vulnerable to these since the beginning of, uh, uh, of computing, but what's really changing is our degree of connectedness. And this is why I really appreciate Fidel running this IoT seminar series. Um, we are depending so much on sensors today. Uh, it's, it's really changed the game. And we're starting to remove, remove human from in the loop. And this leads to automated consequences. So things that may have been completely academic five or 10 years ago are actually becoming uh, important to society right now. Um, and I know a lot of people care about confidentiality and it is really important, but my main concern is for the availability and integrity because most of these are real time kinetic systems, things that cannot be easily undone. Um, and so we need to make sure that our sensors are delivering good data if we're ever going to have any kind of reasonably trustworthy human, uh, human outside of the loop, uh, closed loop systems. And then finally, maybe it's just not a great idea to put a computer in everything unless there's a really good reason. Uh, I built a wood fired brick oven. It's completely analog. Uh, there's only three thermocouples in it and it's a completely analog thermocouple. Um, but I'll just end with a few uh, more bibliographic notes. Um, just a few months ago, um, I helped lead a community event uh, with the Computing Research Association, CCC, uh, to release a document called Grand Challenges for Embedded Security Research in a Connected World. It lays out uh, a lot of what we believe are the grand open problems to solve from a research perspective. Probably will take a good 10 or 20 years to solve uh, from a number of faculty across the world. Um, there's also a lot of interesting work on the acoustic side, uh, the radio wave side, uh, and our most recent work on the optics front, uh, where we're using lasers not to listen to conversations, but lasers to inject false conversations uh, was at USENIC Security 2020. Um, and there's also a huge amount of room for developing defenses. Uh, and again, I laid out those three points of how I believe we can sort of push the needle uh, and, and uh, get much better defenses uh, in the long run. But in the short term, we're dealing with just really uh, sort of brain dead problems like uh, Microsoft Windows spontaneously rebooting when you play one of my maliciously crafted uh, uh, music uh, pieces of music. So in summary, uh, microprocessors should not blindly trust sensors. We need to have a way to verify them. Um, the physics is what led to the problems or really it was the computer scientists who just sort of uh, layered over the physics uh, innocently with good intention, uh, but there's a semantic gap between what the sensors actually sense and what they actually deliver uh, to the software. And if we could just reduce our emphasis on secure components, you know, there's nothing wrong with desiring a secure magic widget. It's just not ever going to happen. Uh, so I think if we focus more on the classic von Neumann building trustworthy systems out of untrustworthy components, we're going to actually have a chance at improving the field. And so how do we make our autonomous vehicles, our satellite systems, uh, our medical devices, uh, our, our automated buildings, how do we get them to work despite having untrustworthy sensors? If we can do that, I think we'll have uh, really helped move the field forward and help society at the same time. Um, so with that, uh, I'll uh, return it back to uh, Fidel, and um, I believe you wanted me to leave about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I'd be happy to do that. Great. Thank you very much. I'm going to also now uh, allow folks to unmute themselves um, if they want to ask questions. Uh, great talk. Um, very inspiring. Very thought-provoking. Um, 
And if folks want to ask questions, there's two ways. A, you can uh, rate, use your raise hand um, feature in Zoom, or you can ask your question. We'd appreciate if uh, you're asking your question, if you were to um, uh, basically uh, show your video uh, so that the speaker can see who he's speaking to. So uh, Patrick, uh, go ahead. Hey, Kevin, thanks for the great talk. Um, I had a question. So in regards to spoofing, you know, like the Alexa or the Google Home system, have you tried doing it using RF based techniques? Kevin, you're on mute. Sorry. Okay, sorry, I should have been using uh, RF interference. No. Um, uh, so, so in that particular case, um, we were just using lasers. Um, we have not tried the RF. I think it'd be really interesting to try it again. And we have a, a cookbook um, from our old Oakland paper where we do use RF on classic, uh, you know, cardboard toilet paper tubes surrounded by copper wire vibrating. Um, I would not be surprised if it also works on these devices. And the way I would personally do it is I would first measure the length of wire between um, the analog component uh, and wherever it gets transduced. Um, one problem you're going to run into, though, with any MEMS microphone is that the analog part is really tiny. My guess is you'd be talking terahertz. So uh, if you don't mind sending me a terahertz transmitter, I'd be glad to check for you. Great. Thanks, Kevin. Ron? Yes, hi, Kevin. Great talk. Um, since elections are coming up, I was thinking about, does any of this apply to election uh, hacking? And the sensor that seems to me the most the one of most interest, although not that relevant for paper ballots, is the touch screen. So, if you could, do you have any uh, insight as to whether those are vulnerable to any of the attacks you're talking about? Right. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Ryan, about voting machines. Um, there's actually a number of researchers, I would say, over the last five years, who've published work at I believe it was Usenix Security, and maybe it was Woops at Usenix on security issues with touch screens and, and being able to uh, do one of two things, causing false presses or recording uh, the touch screen from a distance. It is, there are problems. Uh, and if you just look up um, uh, from some of the Usenix papers, you will find, um, uh, I think if you search on terms like touch screen and capacitive touch sense, capacitive touch sense is probably where you're gonna get the most hits. Great, thank you. You bet. Wait, Venkat, do you want to go next? Hi, thanks for the really inspiring talk. Could you elaborate on the on what you said about us needing a more nuanced threat model than just secure versus not secure? I mean, the question I have in my mind is, if an attacker somehow manages to jam all my sensors, then what is the system supposed to do? Assuming that then it's counter, because it's, if it's a real-time system, it's running completely blind. Right, right. I, so I, I think that's a multifaceted question and I'll, I'll try to answer, although I, I think I see Butler online and uh, I always view him as sort of one of the innovators of this uh, sort of thought process. Um, so one is sort of a worst case scenario, um, an adversary who can cause denial of service, you, that, that's sort of the worst case scenario, but it, you hopefully won't get any worse than that. Um, so a system that could detect de a denial of service in progress could choose to just turn off its sensors and pause. Now, you might not be able to do that if you're a flying automobile or if you're you know, hurling into the sun or something like that. So um, I think these are gonna be very, very application specific. For instance, with pacemakers and defibrillators, there've been many, uh, I think, pretty good designs proposed um, using sort of blade, it's, it's called break glass security, um, where you let safety um, overrule any kind of cybersecurity decisions um, because you'd rather have a system that still exists um, uh, even if it's not secure. Um, uh, but the main point is um, there's, there's a big push toward things like uh, uh, SGX with Intel. And in the old days, it was called like uh, when the 90s, you know, things like Palladium um, and um, basically modules that were trusted with our secrets. And what I'm saying is instead of just sort of uh, waving your hands and saying, I've got a magic box that provides me security properties because it's never going to be able to do that anyway. What I'm saying is have a way to verify that any kind of component giving you input uh, can be have some measurable notion of trustworthiness. 
Um, so if I'm vibrating at my resonant frequency, I'm probably going to have a lot less trust in those measurements, not only from a security standpoint, but from uh, a reliability and safety standpoint as well, because that, that's simply not data you should just feed into some kind of kinetic decision making. Uh, me here? Uh, sure. Um, uh, I just asked a question in the chat, and, and I guess I, I can just say it out loud as well. It's okay. regarding like, um, I guess like, how do you come up originally with some with discovering some of the vulnerabilities? Like, for example, with the hard drive uh, buffer overflows, was that something that kind of came up surprisingly while you were testing other attacks, or is it something that you like look at data sheets and then identify vulnerable components? And then I guess adding on to that, like, do you now have a standard approach, maybe after you've done it for some time, for like identifying for new technologies okay. what might be vulnerable? Yeah, well, side channels are really interesting. By the way, are you in Baker House by any chance? Uh, I am, I am. Yeah, there's a side channel I can tell from your bricks. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, I mean, a lot of the inspiration came from just things in childhood. So uh, in, in the early 90s, I used to do graphics programming on an Apple II GS, which is a really cool uh, uh, old machine you can still find in some museums. Not as cool as a PDP-11, but still, still up there. And the way you used to do animation on the screen is you would write to one bank of memory uh, and then you'd swap the banks as it would draw uh, all the pixels on the screen. And you could start to fill in the next frame of your animation while um, it was simultaneously drawing. Um, and every time I swapped my memory banks, my cordless phone would ring. And so I've always wanted to know why was my cordless phone ringing whenever I was running animations on my old Apple uh, uh, 2GS uh, and so that, you know, it took me about 30 years to figure out that, oh, that was just RF interference. It's probably AM modulation. Uh, and, that, and it just happened to be at the right resonant frequency. Um, but I think the, the other way I think a lot of security researchers do this is they look at specifications and they try to either figure out what's not specified well, or, or the, the most, the easiest one to do is look for the asterisks, like don't do X. So there are a bunch of computer uh, chip sensors I've got that say, do not use an ultrasonic cleanser near me. Um, that's a pretty big tip off that they have some resonant frequencies in the ultrasonic ranges. And so what do we do? We throw ultrasound at it. And sure enough, you can cause really interesting uh, undefined behavior when you change the environment. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Room the reminder for folks who want to ask questions, you can either raise your hand virtually or ask them in the chat. I have a number of questions. So whenever we're waiting for a question, I can just sneak mine in. Um, one question is, it seems still to be more of an art than a science and you're advocating for a science here. Um, what are the, it takes time of course, to go from something from exploration. You, you've been doing this repeatedly. A lot of this is very original. And one question is, how do we go about, what are the steps, what are some of the common themes that we might use to move from an art to the science? For example, there's now software verification. Are there ways for us to develop hardware verification? And this is going to be different from standard EMI testing, which is already done, pretty, whether it's by FDA or FCC or, um, so what are your thoughts on how we might be able to do that? Yeah, well, um... I'd like to think I'd be good at predicting the future, but um, it, it would be amazing if someday we have some kind of hybrid console, multi-physics, IDA Pro uh, compiler magic software toolkit that could just model everything for us. You run it overnight in the morning, it says, just change these couple wires here and you'll be fine. Um, I, I think, if, if you start from the opposite end of the problem, think about what are the smallest building blocks we need to create such that it becomes a solvable problem. I really do think the very simple approach of just making these interfaces instead of just delivering output, have a second channel, maybe it's even just sort of modulated on top of the same wire, but just a little bit of metadata, um, that opens this really rich, I would think, almost like a, like a competition. People could actually compete for the best ways to exploit this metadata to validate the user input. And you get into all sorts of interesting system questions. How fast can you do it? What's the fewest circuits it might take? What's the lowest power way? Um, but I personally just, I don't have any evidence other than just gut feeling. Uh, I feel that just giving this little bit of information is gonna be a game changer from the defender's point of view. Um, it'll probably open up also some side channels. Um, so we have to be mindful of that as well. Um, if we give away too much metadata, 
um, just like the microphone position or rate signal gives nanometer granularity uh, um, error information about how far off you center the track such that you can synthesize a microphone out of something that's never designed to be a microphone. Um, so for that reason, uh, one of my students, Connor Bolton, wrote an SOK, the Systemization of Knowledge paper. Um, for those of you not from the security field, uh, these are sort of survey papers that go beyond a survey and take a general idea and integrate research from many different papers to understand sort of its um, effects in the past and how we might address big problems in the future. And so he talks about how, we, how do we start to design sensors in a way where we can limit, for instance, the amount of unintentional information that comes out of it in, in a more measurable sense, instead of saying it's secure, it's not secure, we just talk about how much information it's leaking. Or we might talk about how fast it can be sampled. Uh, and then using sort of Nyquist-like theorems, you, you can start to make some reasonable guesses on, on what's leaking and, and what's possible. Very exciting. I'll probably offline try to continue this discussion and what are some of the challenges that might arise in electromagnetic uh, simulations for these types of attacks. Cedric, you have a question? Hey, yeah, thank you for this great uh, presentation. I, I was wondering if you could share with us any of the next tensors that you would be interested in attacking at some point. So I sort of have, okay, so attacking things. I sort of have a love-hate relationship with it because um, uh, uh, I used to do um, uh, um, sort of the equivalent to just, you know, looking for buffer overflows. And so I'm not interested in finding a thousand ways to uh, have acoustics hit, you know, 50, you know, a thousand different products. But I am interested in um, what are some new classes of vulnerabilities, entirely new classes of vulnerabilities that we just haven't explored yet. And so that's, that's why I was looking at the optics and, and lasers. It just really interested me because I wasn't aware of anyone using it beyond flipping bits in a register um, at the analog level. Um, so I think from some of the next steps though, to me, uh, there are two. Um, we're spending a lot of time more on the physics right now. So we're spending time in vacuum chambers and uh, barring space, uh, literally from space and aeronautics teams, so we can understand the causality. We don't actually know why the laser attack works. Um, we've talked with the semiconductor manufacturers. We talk with many, many physicists, and they're, they have ideas. They're all stumped. We have a list of the different physics theories that might be at play, but nobody knows. Um, a lot of the companies are trying to um, reproduce the work. They can get the attack to work. They don't know why it works. Um, we have hunches. Everything from the photoacoustic effect uh, to all sorts of other interesting sort of unintentional transduction. Um, so we're spending a lot of time on the physics, um, which is hard during COVID because um, you bring a laser home and yeah, that, you got to be careful. So it's, uh, um, it, it's hard to safely work with lasers. Um, the other area is more in the application space. We're doing a large amount of work with medical devices. So I spent a huge amount of time with the Food and Drug Administration, uh, medical device manufacturers, patient advocacy groups, trying to understand how to make these things more trustworthy. Um, uh, also with autonomous vehicles, we do a lot with computer vision systems right now, uh, especially with LIDAR uh, and um, ultrasonic uh, detection systems. Uh, and then finally, we're spending quite a bit of time. Um, one of my students recently joined uh, SpaceX. Um, and uh, for, for long, longer stories, I, I uh, interact with some folks at SpaceX from time to time. Um, but it's really interesting to me now that we've gone from full satellites to CubeSats down to chipsats, which might not even have any kind of enclosure, which then exposes the entire sensor system to um, any kind of optical line of sight, and then wafer sats. Um, and so I'm particularly concerned about chipsats and wafer sats because they're, they're using things like magnetorquers in order to change their inclination in space. Um, it's, it's, to me, it's kind of like surfing the, the Earth's magnetic, uh, way, uh, 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 magnetic field. They're, they're literally surfing it in order to move. Um, and how do they do that? They have sensors. Um, and uh, one of my goals is I've, I've recently started doing the homework on um, what authorities do I need to get um, sort of permission from to shoot some high-powered lasers into space. Uh, and and um, that, that's one thing I'm working on. I found a great um, desert location. Thank you very much. I love it. Uh, you had had a question in the chat. Um, his question was, what do organizations like UL Underwriters Lab or CE Mark certifications 
have to say about embedded security? Sure. Um, I guess this is the point where I say um, uh, Underwriters Labs UL is one of the um, uh, sponsors of my laboratory. So uh, with, with that conflict out of the way, um, uh, I can't speak for um, other groups, but for UL and places that are similar to UL, um, they have focused a lot on um, specification and testing and certification. Um, I think there's a role for certification and testing, but um, you can't completely test your way out of a problem. The, the testing is a nice way to confirm either you did it wrong or, well, seems like you hit every known problem, but it won't tell you about unknown problems. Um, I think um, where we need a lot of help right now is more at the design stage because it's, it's not that the implementations are bad, but they're implementing the wrong thing in the first place. Uh, they may not have had an interface to give away uh, hints of trustworthiness. Um, so of course, of course it works. Um, I particularly like problems where the threat model is evolving. And so it's, it's not like a hardware designer did something wrong. It's just the threat models have evolved. And um, uh, here's a case where the threat models have changed kind of significantly. Great, exciting. So we're at the 4 p.m. mark. Uh, fantastic set of questions. Great talk. Thank you so much, Kevin, for, for speaking at the IoT seminar series. Um, so folks, if you want to log off, uh, this marks the end of the talk. Um, we had a lot of very exciting um, questions and after a thought-provoking presentation. And this talk will be available online uh, afterwards. It has been recorded. I'm actually going to stop recording now. Um,